The Middle East has been in the middle of a crisis for many years. And interestingly, the very first book of the Bible tells us the origin of the modern crisis in the Middle East. Do you know what the Bible says about the worldwide crisis in the last days and where it came from? Stay tuned and we'll see the origin of the crisis in the Middle East. Welcome to Steps to Life with Dr. John Grossbaum. Sabbath rest is a promise between God and His children. Bible prophecy tells us that we are living in the last days of this earth's history before Jesus' second coming. Today's program will help you prepare for these coming events. Stay tuned. Thanks for joining us. Before we look at the origin of the modern crisis in the Middle East, let's pray that the Lord will help us to understand what we study from His holy book. Father in heaven, we thank you for the Bible, for Bible history and Bible prophecy. And we pray that your spirit will open the eyes of our understanding as we read, that we might understand what you're trying to teach us and know how to be ready for the future. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. We'd like to send you a free book entitled, The Two Destinies. To receive your free book, simply call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for offer FMB4. Have you ever prepared to go somewhere and then have something happen so you could not go? It is very disappointing, is it not? Jesus tells us the kingdom of heaven is going to be like this. Are you preparing for disappointment? Call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for offer FMB4. And now, Pastor John Grosball. In a previous program, we studied about the worldwide flood in the time of Noah. And the Bible is very clear, and we have very good evidence today of where the ark rested. The Bible says it came to a rest in the mountains of Ararat. That's north of Palestine in the land of Turkey today. And that's why that the most ancient nations of the world developed in the Middle East, because Noah and his three sons and their wives were the only people left living upon the earth after the flood and all of the world's population are descendants from Noah. However, something terrible happened among Noah's poster posterity. They became involved almost universally in idolatry. The first development of this worldwide idolatry was the building of the Tower of Babel. The Bible says that at that time, the world was all of one language and of one speech. But instead of dispersing abroad in the earth, they decided to centralize, and come all together. And so the Lord frustrated their plans by mixing up their language. You can read about that in Genesis 10 and 11. And their languages were mixed up so that they couldn't understand one another and different people that could understand each other's language departed to different parts of the earth. And so the people were dispersed abroad in the earth, but it seemed that idolatry took over the whole world after the development of the Tower of Babel. Today, both from looking at ancient history and by studying the archaeology and all the ancient historic records, we know that idolatry seemed to be a universal constant in the ancient world. Among all the nations of antiquity, idolatry was practiced. So, the people became so hardened in sin that, well, the Bible says what God did here in Romans, the first chapter. It says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And then it says, Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And it says, then God gave them up also to uncleanness. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. That's Romans 1, 25. They, they served, they worshiped the creature rather than the creator. If you look at the most ancient nations, the Hittites, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, 
they were all steeped in idolatry. And so, just as Paul says, God gave them up. He left them go in the ways of their idolatry for thousands of years, but God did not leave himself without witness. God chose one man who lived down in Ur, near the city of Babylon, and through this one man, he, the Lord determined to keep alive a knowledge of the true God, the evil of idolatry, and the necessity of following and obeying the true God if you were going to have salvation or eternal life. God opened up to this man the plan of salvation. Jesus said in John 8, he said, Abraham saw my day and he was glad. To, the, to Abraham, God opened up the plan of salvation. Abraham lived, even his own relatives were all idolaters. They all worshiped idols. And God made Abraham a wonderful promise when he called him out from Ur of the Chaldees. This is what God promised Abraham. He said, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God gave to Abraham a wonderful promise, especially comforting and thought provoking to the people of that generation. Because in those days, people wanted to have a numerous posterity. God promised Abraham a numerous posterity and also national greatness. Not only that, Abraham was promised that through his descendants, the Redeemer of the world would be born. God said to him, in your seed, all nations shall be blessed. All the families of the earth shall be blessed. But before Abraham could receive these wonderful promises, he had to be tested. And here is the test that God gave to Abraham with the condition that he was going to give him these wonderful blessings. He gave them this test. Genesis 12 verse 1. It says, the Lord has said to Abraham, get out of your country from your kindred and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. The Lord said, get out from your, leave your homeland, your relatives, your friends, your home, leave your country and go to a land that I will show you. Notice, God did not tell Abraham what land he was going to take him to. He didn't tell Abraham where he was going. Abraham didn't know where he was going. How would you like to try to explain to your family that the Lord had told you that you had to leave your home? You had to leave your relatives. You had to leave your country and you were going to have to dwell alone apart from them and you were going to leave but you did not know where you were going. You were going to go wherever the Lord led you. This is this story of the call of Abraham is one of the most striking evidences, one of the most striking stories illustrating faith in all the Bible. Notice what the New Testament says about it. In Hebrews, the 11th chapter, it says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would afterward receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. He couldn't explain to his family, to his friends, to his countrymen the reason for his actions. And so, he was brought into a situation which required him to simply trust in the Lord and then take the next step. He didn't know what the third or fourth step would be. All he knew was 
that he was going to have to leave home. He was going to have to leave his relatives and leave his country. He did not have at that time the least outward assurance that the promise would be fulfilled. That when God spoke to Abraham, Abraham obeyed. He abandoned his home, his kindred, his relatives, and his native land. And he went out not knowing where he was going to go. He was just going to go wherever the Lord would lead him. Now, we know the story because we can read it in the Bible. The Lord eventually led him to the land of Canaan and told him that he would give him that land. But in Hebrews 11 verse 9, concerning Abraham's dwelling in the land of promise, this is what is described. Hebrews 11 verse 9, By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. And then it goes on to say he did look for a city, but he was looking for a city that was made by God himself. That's the city, of course, that is described in Revelation 20 and 21. This was no light test that was brought upon Abraham to leave his family, his home, his country. But Abraham had no question to ask. Abraham was a man of faith. He didn't ask the Lord and say, well now, is the climate healthful in the place that you're going to take me? He didn't say to the Lord, well, is the land fertile? Are there, will there be opportunities to make a good living or to become wealthy in that place? When God spoke, Abraham obeyed. There are several instances mentioned in the book of Genesis where when God told Abraham something and then Abraham obeyed immediately. When God spoke, Abraham obeyed. The happiest place on this earth was for him the place where God wanted him to be. There are still people today that, call, that God calls like he called Abraham. Not by voice from the heavens, but by his word, the teachings of his word, and the events of his pro providence. Sometimes those that follow God are required to abandon a, a career that promises wealth and honor, to leave congenial and profitable associations, and to separate from their kindred, to enter what seems to be simply a path of self-denial and hardship and sacrifice. The reason for this is that God has a work for them to do, just like he had for Abraham. But a life of ease, the influence of friends and kindred, sometimes hinders the development of the very traits essential for a person to do what God wants them to do. And so the Lord has to take them away from their familiar associations from where they grew up so that they learn how to depend upon him alone. <clears throat> if you are willing like Abraham, to go wherever the Lord leads you. If, for willing, if you are willing, for Christ's sake, to endure whatever you need to endure, to do God's service, the result will be that you will develop a faith like Abraham, and you will share with him in what the Bible calls that far greater and exceeding eternal weight of glory, with which the Bible says, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared. Abraham went first to Haran and he was there until his father died. And after Abraham's father died, God gave him another command that he was to go forward. And his, he left with his nephew Lot and his retainers and he came into the land of Canaan but when he came into the land of Canaan, he was met with one series of discouraging circumstances after another. Have you ever been discouraged? Have you ever had discouraging circumstances and been tempted to say, well, if the Lord is leading me, why are all these terrible things happening to me? Well, what did Abraham do when he got into this kind of a situation? Stay tuned, we'll see. Sometimes studying the Bible on your own without any help or a guideline to follow can be a little difficult. And after confusion and frustration set in, we all too often turn to other things. If this sounds like you, 
you're not alone. The Steps to Life Bible Correspondence School is just the answer. Call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for your free Bible Correspondence Starter Pack. I really enjoyed being able to study at home. I'm a new Christian and I definitely knew I needed some guidance. Simply review each lesson and answer the questions. These studies were great. It just seemed like the Bible opened up for me. Then send the completed lesson back to us in the envelope provided. These studies were very professional, they didn't take a lot of time, and I really appreciated that. A Bible teacher will then look over each lesson and send them back to you with the next set of studies. It's that simple and totally free. Call Steps to Life Television at 1-800-THE-TRUTH. I'm so glad I called. Welcome back. When Abraham got to the land of Canaan, and of course the Canaanites, that's why it was called the land of Canaan, because the Canaanites dwelt in that land. He found, of course, that the country was a very fertile country. It was a, it was a place where there was wheat and barley and fig trees and pomegranates and olive trees. and It was a very fertile country, but there was something depressing about the country too. You see, all over the land of Canaan, which was occupied by an alien race, it was overspread with idolatry. There were idolatrous groves set up and altars to false gods. And we know today from the study, not just of ancient history, but also from archaeology, that in that ancient country, people offered human sacrifices. So it was with distressful forebodings that he pitched his tent there, but yet the Lord had led him there. The Bible says that wherever Abraham pitched his tent, there he built an altar. And he is called in the Bible, you can read it in the New Testament, James 2, 23, concerning Abraham, it says, he was called the friend of God. He was called the friend of God. He took time to pray. Abraham was a man of prayer. Wherever he pitched his tent, right beside it, he built an altar. And he called all in his encampment to both morning and evening worship service. After Abraham arrived there and had lived there for a while, he continued his journey southward and then he came into terrible trouble because the Bible says that there was a great famine that developed in the land. And of course, Abraham had much flocks and herds. And now there was no grass, there was no pasture. And so his entire encampment, his entire operation was threatened with starvation. Abraham could not explain the leadings of, of providence. He had not realized his expectations, but he held fast to the promise. God had said, I will bless you and make your name great and you will be a blessing. So he clung to the promise even though he could not understand what was going on and he made earnest prayer that the Lord would show him what to do. And he decided to go south even farther into the land of Egypt to try to save his cattle, his herds, and of course his family. Why did this happen? Why did God allow a famine? God could have controlled things so there wouldn't have been a famine. Why was a famine allowed? Well, friends, the fact of the matter is that God leads his children by a way that you and I do not know. God leads his children by a way that they know not. But the Bible says, that God does not forget or cast off those who put their trust in Him. Notice what it says in Hebrews, the 13th chapter. And actually, the Bible writer here is quoting from Deuteronomy and from Joshua. In Hebrews 13, it says, Be content with such things as you have, for He Himself has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. So God has promised to never leave or forsake his children. God did not forsake Job, although he allowed terrible affliction to come to him. He did not forsake 
Moses, when he had to flee, he did not forsake Joseph or David. He did not forsake Abraham, but he allowed trials to come upon them for reasons that we in our present state cannot explain. The Lord does say, though, what he thinks. He says in Jeremiah 29, I know the thoughts that I have toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. The very trials that test our faith most severely and make it seem that God has forsaken us are to lead us closer to Christ. The, the prophet Isaiah writes about this experience of trials in his book, Isaiah 48, and he talks about the purpose of these trials. He says in Isaiah 48, this is the Lord speaking, Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. God has always tested His people in the furnace of affliction. It is by close testing trials that God disciplines His servants. He puts each one of us on trial. And in His providence, He brings us into different positions to test our character and to reveal to us the defects and weaknesses that we have that we need to overcome. And when Abraham went down to Egypt, he revealed that he was a human being that had weaknesses of character just like other human beings. As he drew near down to Egypt, he told his wife, he said, don't tell anybody that you are my wife. This is the way it's recorded in Genesis 12. It says, when he was close to entering Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you, that they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. So it was when Abram came into Egypt, that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say, She is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. The Bible does not condone telling false witness, telling lies, in order to get yourself out of a difficult situation. This is what God said to the children of Israel when he gave them the Ten Commandments and wrote them on ten ta two tables of stone. It's recorded in Exodus 20 and verse 16, the ninth commandment, it says, You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Well, the Lord got Abraham out of the difficult situation in which he was in, but Abraham was also reproved for what he had done that was wrong. The psalmist refers to this experience of Abraham in Psalm 105, verses 13 to 15. It says, When they went from one nation to another, from one kingdom to another people, he permitted no one to do them wrong. Yes, he reproved kings for their sakes, saying, Do not touch my anointed ones, and do my prophets no harm. So, Abraham was sent away, 
Abraham and Sarah were both reproved for their lack of faith and for not telling the truth. This warning that had been given to Pharaoh, however, by the Lord proved to be a protection for Abraham later because all the time of his life when he dwelt among heathen peoples, the matter could not be kept secret and it became widely known that the God that Abraham worshiped would protect his servant and that any injury done to him would be avenged. The fact of the matter is, it is a dangerous thing to wrong one of the children of the King of Heaven. People do it all the time in this world and think that they will get away with it, but they are not going to get away with anything. The records in heaven, in the records in heaven, God has a record of every drop of blood that has been extorted by torture. God has a record of all the pain and suffering that His servants have endured in this world at the hands of the devil and his agents. And if you read the last part of the book of Revelation, everyone will be judged according to his works and pay the price of his sins that have not been repented of, confessed, forsaken, and forsaken. But the Bible makes it very clear that what Abraham did was wrong. He had exercised a lack of faith. He had told a lie. It was true that Sarah was his half-sister, but it was still a lie. And the Bible is very clear, friend, that if you want to go to the kingdom of heaven, you cannot be a liar. You must learn to tell the truth. And you must confess the lies you have told and make them right. Notice what it says here in Revelation 21. It says, The cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Three times in the last two chapters of the book of Revelation, the Lord tells us that no liar will be in the kingdom of heaven. And astonishingly, this is one of the most common sins in the world today. And yet the Bible says no liar will be in the kingdom of heaven. We just read Revelation 21.8. Notice what it says in Revelation 21.27. It says, there sh it's talking about the holy city. And there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. There you have it again. There'll be nobody there who's a liar. And then here's the third time, Revelation 22:15. Those that are outside the holy city will be the dogs, the sorcerers, sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. Oh friend, you want to have eternal life. If you want to have eternal life, you must learn to always tell the truth. We hope you've received a blessing from today's program. We'd like to send you a free book entitled, The Two Destinies. Call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for offer FMB4. Are you preparing yourself for disappointment? Are you preparing to have Jesus say to you, I do not know you? There are people who have been preparing all their lives to be a part of the marriage supper, but they will not be able to go. How can you know you will be admitted to that great banquet? What are the requirements? What does the Bible say about this very important subject? How can you be sure that Jesus will say to you, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Simply call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for offer FMB4. Call now. From all of us here at Steps to Life, may God bless you as you continue to seek His truth. We hope that this sermon has been a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. Our mailing address is Steps to Life, P.O. Box 782-828, Wichita, Kansas 67278. You may call us at 1-800-THE-TRUTH. That's 1-800-843-8788. Our email address is historic at stepstolife.org. And our web address is www.stepstolife.org. May God be with you as you seek to walk the narrow way.